All right. We'll go ahead and get started. Uh, today we're going to do a multimodality on the aorta. And um, I'm going to shorten my talk um, to some essentials, given that, A, we're in a place where we have the benefit of both dynamic CT and superb CMR, and clearly we're using it a lot in assessing patients with aortic disease. When you finish and you go and practice, you may or may not have that luxury that we have here. So I still think it's important that you do have some knowledge about what we can do with echocardiography um, because you may need to have that knowledge. Otherwise, you'll have to be sending us all your patients over here, which we'll be, we'll be happy to take to. Uh, so I'd like to spend time on the imaging views by transthoracic and TE. Very important topic, which is the serial assessment of ascending aorta size, and I'll, you'll see why this is a very practical point of view. We'll talk a little bit about dissections, again, because uh, TEE is still the easiest technique to be at the bedside when you have a critically ill patient for a dissection. Again, we use it less these days because frequently many patients already have been diagnosed elsewhere, or because we can diagnose them rapidly now with the dynamic CT. Aortic rupture is a rare condition. I'm not going to spend too much time on it. Uh, you may go your whole life and not see a case. Um, basically, it's a pseudo aneurysm. And again, for the sake of providing more time to uh, CT and MRI, I'm not going to spend too much time on that. And I will spend some time in aortic debris because, again, I think TE is still the gold standard for assessing uh, debris in the aorta, in the ascending or descending aorta. So talking about the views, uh, this is your traditional parastenal long axis view. And of course, you see the aortic root, and you might get to see up to the sinus tubular junction, and that's about it. If you're concentrating on seeing a good heart, that's about as much as we see from the aorta. And that's the view that 99.999% you know, of the time our sonographers will get for us. Now, the other view that I would like to um, get everybody here, all the sonographers, to agree that this probably should become a routine view. It's a little higher up in the ascending aorta. And with a little bit of work, uh, you can get that view in 90% of patients. Um, not always, but even sometimes technically difficult patients, you'll be, you're surprised if you work at it, you get the ascending aorta. And, and I'll show you a case later why that's important. Uh, this ascending aorta, as you can see, if we were to measure it, it's going to be close to four, which is a little bit on an upper, upper end of normality, depending on body size. And then the uh, supersternal gives us kind of the mid to distal arch, doesn't give us much of the proximal arch, but you get that curvature, you get the subclavian coming out, and, and, and if something is happening right there, you might be able uh, to catch it. And of course, you can look at the size of the aorta. And then descendings are the most difficult ones. And to be honest, the best views probably are the short axis views, the same old short axis that we used uh, to look at the LV. But if you basically orient the transducer to be parallel to the spine, so you ignore the heart is going to look very funny. But if you orient yourself parallel to the spine, then you may be able to open nicely um, the descending aorta. And then finally, of course, the subcostal view that give you a look, gives you a look at the uh, ascending aorta, um, uh, abdominal aorta. So with the TE, again, the same story. In the traditional 120, 130 degree LV outflow view, you will see the uh, aortic root. Here you see actually a little bit more of the ascending aorta. But if you want to really see a lot more of that ascending aorta, the 120 will foreshorten the aorta. So if you get down to about 100, 90 to 100, the aortic valve and aortic root may not look as pretty and as good as they look in here, but you get a much nicer look at the ascending aorta. And you can pull the probe up until you lose the images because of air in the trachea. And that's the blind spot for TEE which is somewhere in here where you may not be able to reach it from any angle, and that, that has been called the blind spot because if you have a very localized process there, like, for example, a tiny small tear uh, with a hematoma, you could miss. Then we get to the traditional uh, descending thoracic where basically you turn the probe around, and you, you guys all know it from doing TEs, 
and, and that's a pretty straightforward view. Now with the X-plane, you always get a very nice shot, and we can basically move up, and then eventually you turn and see the arch. And again, notice that you tend to lose a little bit of the arch around here. So this, is, this gets us back to the, this some spot around here that either between not being able to reach it using the uh, 100 degrees or not being able to reach it from the um, coming back into the aorta, we might not be able to, to we might miss. And I, how the heck did I do that? Okay. Now, I want to take you back again to this view. And this is a nice example why I think this view is so important. What happened here? Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, this is a 55-year-old man that I've been following now for five or six years. Um, he has a um, bicuspid aortic valve. He has some AS that he still has not matured. He has an ascending aortic aneurysm. And he's had uh, a couple of CTs before I ever saw him. Then I did a, an MRI, and he hated me forever because he's claustrophobic. And of course, Dr. Shah had him there for an hour and a half because he was doing a meticulous assessment of not the aorta, but also the aortic valve and everything else. Um, and so he pleaded with me to have an open MRI the next time, which he did, had one open MRI. And uh, then we discovered that we could actually see his ascending aorta very nicely um, by the views I just told you. And he has, uh, he, his last MRI was at 48 millimeters, and right here we can see exactly 48 millimeters. So. The beauty of, if you can do this, is that, of course, you save the patient a lot of money, radiation with CTs, and even some of the discomfort of an MRI that some people have a lot of claustrophobia with. So, I mean, for, for an outpatient routine, once you have established sizing, once you may have done either one CT or one MRI, um, and established sizing, if you get a good view here, hey, you know, you have a nice way of following that patient and then deciding when you may want to repeat that MRI or repeat the CT. And the patient will really be very happy with that. So I, I really plead with the sonographers, spend time learning and getting that view. It's a very important view. We can help them when we order the echo by specifying ascending aorta. Look at, you know, because that way they know we want specific uh, look at that. Okay, so that's one practical point that I like to bring. So dissections, you are in a place where uh, Dissections were classified by Dr. DeBakey, 1, 2, and 3, uh, 3A and 3B. And Stanford then sim simplified it into A's and B. A's for ascending, B for the descending aorta, with the caveat being that the class 2 is just localized to the ascending aorta, where class 1 crosses the arch and, and the subclavian, and then could end anywhere, anywhere here, all the way down to the legs. Um, class, class 3 or B start after the subclavian and could end up anywhere. So if it's a small one, they call it 3A, and if it goes all the way down, it's a 3B. But uh, as you know, the importance is that most of the time, this group needs immediate intervention unless they already, by natural selection, passed the natural history and then they're sent here late. But if somebody comes in acutely, you don't know what they're going to do in the next... Uh, uh, two weeks, uh, you have to intervene acutely because they do have a very high early mortality. Um, class B, class uh, uh, type threes or Bs are treated usually medically unless they're showing signs of impending rupture and things like that. So with TEE, um, this would be a slam dunk, level one, nobody argues. Notice why is it that we see this so quickly and we know it's a dissection? First, we see a line that doesn't belong there. Second, we see actually two lines that don't belong there. And then we see that line is moving. But it's moving not in concert with the motion of the heart. So it has a movement of its own. And I think that, as we will see later, is probably the most important cue to have when you are looking for dissections. Here we, are in the aort uh, here we have a type 2, which basically ends before the arch starts, before the descending aorta starts. And this would then be, uh, hopefully, <laughs> if it plays, I think a type 3, which starts after the subclavian. Okay? So this is clean, and then the dissection starts after the subclavian. False negatives. 
Can they happen? Yes. How often? If you know how to do TEs properly, very, very infrequent. Most recent studies show neck-to-neck -neck sensitivities of TEEs with CMR and, and so on. Okay? Can it happen? Yes, it can happen. Most commonly because of the blind spot area. Very small localized dissection, usually in that area that, I, that we discussed before. And then occasionally an intramural hematoma uh, may be missed. A intramural hematomas are a little different because they don't have the flap that we talk about. It's a more of a inside bleeding within the vessel wall, and those can be a little bit more difficult to pick up. And in studies comparing TE with CMR, uh, there's a suggestion that CMR may be a little bit uh, uh, superior to TE. But again, these are, these are more rare lesions, but you have to be aware of them, particularly if you have somebody with the right symptoms. False positive is 99% of the time artifacts. Occasionally, if you have an aortic aneurysm with a thrombus, it could kind of look alike, but most of the time you can, you can take care of that one. It's really the artifacts that can be a problem. Like this one, okay? So you see that thing jumping there. Is that a dissection? Okay? You know, it's, it's very, you know, you say, whoops, let's stop and look, because clearly that will catch your eye the first time you see it. So is it yes or no? Okay? So again, it goes back to what I said earlier. A real flap has an oscillating movement uh, that is not related to the aortic wall. Artifacts tend to move parallel to the aortic wall. And um, you see that one there. Actually, the first time you see that, that is really very impressive. This one, this one will make you stop and relook because, I mean, it's, it's right there flipping in your eyes, okay? You do an end mode, and now you can see that that linear structure is moving totally in concert with the walls, which is very typical of an artifact. This one is not actually as prominent as the other one, okay? And the first time you, you look at that, I can tell you, I, I, I would have to say, oh, gee whiz, I don't know, maybe dissection, maybe an artifact. It's even less prominent. But look what happened when we go to the short axis view. Now we see that area there. And look what happened when we went to the arch. Okay. So again, you don't, you don't put all your eggs in one view. You look at the entire aorta because most of the time if you have a, uh, an ascending uh, dissection, it's going to end up somewhere. So uh, this one is a, a type 2 uh, that is ending in the arch. But now you can see that nicely, and you can see that nicely, and, and you can wrap it up. Um, and you can see now that there is movement of that flap that is independent to the movement of, of the walls. The other thing that I have to remember is that dissections don't happen in a straight line. In fact, they commonly go elliptical. So they start in one place, and they kind of roll around like this as they are progressing. And that's why sometimes in one tomographic plane, you'll see two flaps. It's not that you have two dissections. It's that you're catching two points of that elliptical rotation of the, uh, uh, of the dissection, which when you do 3D reconstruction, uh, with other imaging modalities, or even with, with 3D uh, TE, uh, you can then very nicely uh, pick up. Maybe, I don't know, Steve, do you have a 3D of that? That would be really cool. I, I don't have one. I I, that, shows, that shows the elliptical, yeah, that would be pretty cool. Um, so, you made a diagnosis. What else do you need? Well, actually, 99% of the time, what you need is a diagnosis. Uh, however, you do want to look at the aortic root to see if the aortic root uh, it's not huge because if it's huge, they're going to need to replace that too and do a, more of a composite graph. Um, because otherwise, what you want to do is just put a graph in the sinus tubular junction on, but spare the aortic root. Um, you want to look for valvular problems, of course, if there is AR, severity and mechanism of AR. And then you want to look at sizing of the descending thoracic aorta because both type 1s and type 3s, the descending aorta, can, the false lumen can enlarge to a point that could become a problem. And in fact, once you have treated the acute condition, either with medicines for a type 3 or with surgery for a type 1, what is left now is following up the descending aorta. The progression of that, would that patient do well? Would that patient eventually need a s procedure down the road because the false lumen continues to expand and then it becomes an expanding aneurysm? with the risk for rupture, in which case then you have to decide whether stenting, surgery, or what. And that's a role, actually, that I want to leave time because I know that, that, that uh, 
Faisal we may talk a little bit more about that for the role of, of uh, CMR these days. Um, one thing about the neck vessels, you can take the TE probe after you're done and put it right on the neck. I mean, it's just a simple thing. It's a probe. You clean it, put it here, and take, do a little carotid. And here's one. There's a flap. Go. Now, it's all right. So, he, so he's dissecting. What are you going to do about it? I mean, it's not to change the treatment. It's still going to do the same thing. So that's kind of a nice extra credit. Um, but it's not necessarily that because you saw that you're going to do anything dramatically different. But, but you can, it's very easy to do. To just take the probe, clean it, put a little thing there, stick it in the neck, and, and scan the neck. Uh, and of course, precarial effusion, very important. Precarial effusion is almost like a kiss of death. Even a small effusion is an indication to get your butt and take that patient to the OR within minutes. We have seen catastrophes happen in less than 30 minutes. So if you see a precarial effusion in any type 1 or type A dissections, it's not like, okay, call the surgeon at home. No, it's get the guy to the OR now. Because it really is one of the most in me impending disasters that you have in your hands if you don't act. All right, so there's a lot of a color there. Looks like a lot of AI. But the question is, why? So what do you all think? Jeff, what do you think is the cause of the AI there? Of what? You got it. I was reading there, so it made it easy for you. <laughs> we'll believe you. you. You look like an honest guy. Good guy from a lot. <laughs> That's right. You, if you had just jumped at it, you would have been more suspect. <laughs> so you played it well. <laughs> That's right. And, and that happens often. It's that just the, the flap prolapses through the aortic valve, and then, of course, impedes the closure and causes AI. Treatment for that is 3D dissection. Whereas if you did not have that phenomenon, and if you had a thickened valve, and it's not closing well, and the aortic root is now five, now you have a different story, right? Now you have a situation where you have perhaps a combination of aortic valvular disease and, or aortic root dilation, and now the whole therapy of the dissection gets a little bit more complicated from a surgical point. Type 3 is, again, you make a diagnosis. Most of the time, that's good enough for initiation of therapy, which is medical. And basically, your concern now is for anything that may suggest that there is a, 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 a rupture with a pseudoaneurysm and a false lumen formation, which, again, is not common. And patients usually have a fair amount of pain. And again, if you do a good scanning of the entire uh, uh, aorta with, through the esophagus, uh, and you, now with the explain, it's even easier. You can pick those, a point where using color flow, you will see color going into a space that is outside the aorta. So it really is not that difficult a diagnosis, although it's a rare condition. You, you should be able to diagnose it. We've seen a few cases here, and we haven't missed them. Even though the first time we saw it, we had never seen one before. But it's so apparent that you see a, a color jet is going someplace where it's outside the aorta, it's a cavity, there's a lot of clot formation in, in that pseudoaneurysm and so on. It's not a difficult diagnosis to make. Um, other than that, basically, you're going to treat them medically. So um, usually, the chronic dissections are considered after two weeks because that's the time where most of the bad things acutely have happened. And um, when you repair a type A, you convert it into a type, type B. So it's the same thing. You're now following the aorta for late events, where now what you're interested in is progressive sizing of the descending aorta with the dissection, including the false lumen, to see if there is false lumen expansion or if there is false lumen healing. So as you, as you progress and you follow patients, initially you're going to see them do something every three or four months, then per, perhaps later every six, perhaps eventually. I have a lady I've been seeing for 20 years. She gets now a CMR every two years because she's been so stable. Um, so basically, you know, you, you space your serial assessment, and for that, I think, clearly, we have better imaging technology today. We could do TEs, but I think we have so much many more things that we can do now with uh, CMR and CT that I, I think I should leave some time for them to, to talk about it. 
Um, and the last thing I want to talk, because this one clearly, I think, is clearly one where TEE has the, the, the big edge, is looking at atheromas in the aorta. This is the traditional classification. Uh, grade twos are just basically thickening of the wall. Grade three now, you have a greater thickening, and you have some level of irregularity. Grade fours are just huge chunks of plaques that even uh, a, a fellow in day one of TE would not miss because they are so, so apparent. And when you see them in real time, as we see them periodically when we do TEs, see, this would be like a grade three, very apparent. And notice that then they have little areas there, those things that are flickering often. If you look around, you can see these little flickering things. So the question is, what are they? So explain really has helped a lot because when you put your line right where you are suspicious, you can see very nicely this raised grade three ateroma in a corner that if we had done a traditional um, 90 degree, we might have missed. So this is one of the beauties of the X-plane, is being able to shoot it right there and convert into the longitudinal plane that you will see from there and nicely see that plaque. That is pretty scary. Now those, again, nobody would miss. And you can see all the, look at that, all these linear things that are flying and moving and looking like flying objects. Sometimes we have called them that in particular. So this is one area where I think because of the resolution quality combined with the time resolution, TE continues to be the, uh, the, the uh, gold standard. And uh, you can do 3Ds if you want to show pretty pictures, but I think the 2D does a pretty good job on its own with the X-plane particularly. These are just more examples, so you can see all the different variations that you can see. Not uncommonly, these people are in their late 70s, 80s, but we have seen a few late 50s and early 60s with this. So it all depends on how bad uh, you know, your genes and your atherosclerosis and your aorta has been. This is you know, basically atherosclerosis disease of the aorta. The question is, what are the flying objects? Okay, this is another uh, 3D of, of this particular one here. You can see it there nicely. I think this was done by you, Steve. I think I took it from you. Yeah. So 100 years ago, well, not quite, but in 1997, um, when Dr. Sobey was a lot more younger, <laughs> this was a really, this was a classic study because this was a study that uh, Nathan, who is now a grandfather, uh, was one of our fellows, uh, did um, where Dr. Crawford, I believe, was still alive. And uh, when we made these diagnoses in the uh, TE room, uh, he was kind enough to let us see what that was and send to pathology, and they were all thrombus. So, you know, 99, let's, you know, if you want to say the rule of 100, the rule of 99.9 .9 is that when you see these flying objects, they are thrombus. So you will say, ah, great news, we can anticoagulate and cure them. Well, actually, it has been very disappointing. A lot of the trials that have been done with these lesions um, have not been very good. Uh, whether you use warfarin, whether you use um, platelet inhibitors, um, whether you randomize to different trials, different things, uh, the outcomes still are not great. The patients still have recurrences of uh, embolization. We had one case I can remember, maybe Bill remembers the patient better, but remember that was one case, this was so horrendous that the patient went for a thoracic abdominal replacement. Is the only one I can remember. And, I mean, it was truly horrendous. And, and the patient had already had, had a series of uh, embolizations, and, and we sort of said, like, I don't know what else we can do. So she had the, uh, the aorta replaced. I mean, uh, I don't think, uh, I don't even remember. I don't think we even wrote it off. We just did it, but <laughs> and it stayed in the archives of Methodist Hospital. But uh, it just shows you the frustration that sometimes you go through when you take care of some of these patients. So TEE. Clearly, is the gold standard for diagnosis, but the unfortunate thing is that we don't have really any great treatments right now for this condition. Okay, so uh, thank you, Dr. Q. Um, I will present the CTCMR version of aortic disease. This is going to be a whirlwind tour of the aorta. Uh, some things that I have learned, uh, some um, uh, just going over mostly, uh, you know, all the um, uh, the worst pathologies of aortic disease. Um, it's going to be very CT heavy, and the only reason is, is you know, CMR will really provide the same uh, types of images. So yeah, I just chose one modality and kind of ran with it. Um, okay, so just uh, you know, I'll 
out of curiosity, introduction to aortic diseases, you know, it's really the largest artery in the human body. Pumps up to 200 million liters of blood in an average lifetime. We have a wide variety of clinical scenarios that we can pre patients can present with, which can be acute or chronic. But some of the things that I will be discussing are aortic aneurysms, dissections, all the acute aortic syndromes. Um, I won't be discussing um, inflammatory diseases, and I'll mention one congenital abnormality. But main thing to know is the, this is really becoming more prevalent in Western countries, uh, the um, awareness of aortic diseases, and it's thought to be because of advanced imaging modalities, which can now detect a lot of these diseases, as well as the longer lifespan. Yes. Yes. What what is the guideline Right. So um, I'll come to it. Okay. It's coming in a few slides, and I'll show you exactly how we do it. So, <laughs> Dr. Q, the slides for you. Um, Echo, you really don't see anything unless I, Dr. Q does it <laughs> for the order. He's gone. <laughs> All right, so CT and MRI, right? What are their advantages? Look, you have wide coverage. You can see the entire aorta, including its branches. We have superior image quality. You can take both these, uh, these data sets and reconstruct it, both 2D and 3D, in any orientation you want. And as well, you can assess extravascular structures. So, um, um, so just to get into it, we have to know a little bit about anatomy, so we all talk the same things. Uh, this is the aorta. And it's divided into specific segments. And when we make measurements, especially in CMR, we're very particular to make these measurements in the same location. So the, the ascending aorta is really is defined from the aortic root all the way to the brachiocephalic trunk. It includes the aortic root and the tubular ascending aorta. The aortic arch is from the brachiocephalic uh, trunk to the left subclavian, uh, the descending thoracic aorta is from the left subclavian down to the you know, crux of the diaphragm for the, uh, the aorta. There is a segment in the descending thoracic aorta uh, called the isthmus. The isthmus is defined as that region from the left subclavian artery to the ligamentum arteriosum. Um, when it comes to aortic diseases, uh, you know, if you look at our CMR reports, all of these measurements are there. These are very standardized measurements. There are some normal variants that we should uh, know about. Uh, a common one is the bovine arch. These are just some normal variants I'll mention. One that I was not aware of, but I have seen several times um, and had to learn a little bit about was the ductus diverticulum. This is really a remnant of the ductus. It, you know, and I'll show you a case of transection of the order. It looks very, very different. Uh, this is very smooth margins. There's no irregularity or thrombus, but this is a normal variant. And there's another normal variant called a pseudocoarctation, where you really have an unfolded aorta with redundant aortic tissue. Of course, the arch anatomy gets much more complicated than this, and uh, especially in our congenital heart disease patients, and um, uh, this is a lecture in and of itself. So what do we know about the aorta? Well, there's been a, a lot of slides coming up, just some about measurements. And what we know is that usually the largest measurement is at, in the ascending aorta um, and gradually tapers downstream from there. So if you look, the, the middle line is really your mean. You know, the, av the number that, apart from the aortic root, where the sinus of the salve is generally 3.7, 3.8, the normal aorta is around 3 centimeters or less. That's the best way to remember uh, uh, numbers. Uh, this is a table of measurements of how, you know, of what are normal uh, by the guidelines. You can see a lot of these measurements were made by CT, and we'll go specifically over. <laughs> <laughs> the talk may be over. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Uh, uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think you liked that one slide of mine. <laughs> okay, so a, a, lot of, a lot of the confusion in the literature when it comes to measurements from what I was reading about yesterday 
is a lot of these measurements, even though it says the method of measuring was by CT, these were based on axial measurements. Or even a lot of measurements have been from chest x-rays. So uh, from a very recent publication that I read yesterday, a lot of confusion of what normal values for the aorta really may not have been very firmly established because they are not, they have not been measured in the way that I will be presenting you, to you uh, in the upcoming slides. But in general, this will give you an idea. You know, the n normal root is between 3, 7, 3, 8, um, and the rest of the order should be less than 3. So is this outside? Uh, yeah, th well, this is external to external. Okay, so when it comes down to aortic measurements, there's a lot of factors that go into place. It varies, you know, based on age, sex, uh, body size, where you make these measurements, obviously, and the robustness of the imaging me methods you're using. If you look here, if you look at normal ascending um, aorta measurements, you can see that as we age, the, it is a normal phenomenon for the aorta to measure bigger than uh, a person who's um, young. And you can see that for normal descending thoracic aorta measurements as well. Uh, of this, I don't know. That's the high. That's the that's the that's the high. The the highlighted one, the red and the blue, are the uh, the means. Yeah. We learned the lesson with blood pressure. We thought it was normal until people did some really good epidemiologic studies showing that they were having trouble, having problems. So do we, can we call this normal or until now, let's say for now, they're normal? I, I think it's a great point, Dr. Q. I, this data, I, I need to find out what what the po population was that they were studying. Were these you know, people without hypertension? Yeah. Yeah. These would probably be all, because this is old data, it's probably axial measurements, yeah. But again, 4.5 being the, you know, two standard deviations um, above. Um, we also know that BSA makes a big difference. Uh, here is just some measurements of looking at a person's BSA and just looking at the size of their sinus of a salva. Um, um, so you know, just another factor. Um, when it comes to measuring the aorta, it's very, very important, especially for CT, not much as an issue with MRI, that we gate the thoracic aorta in order to make accurate measurements. Great example is on the left side side of the screen. If you don't gate, you get a lot of motion. Uh, this motion is called a pulsation artifact. It can be easily mimicked for an aortic dissection. You gate the images, you will, uh, you, you're able to clearly see um, uh, the boundaries of your measurements. Now, is not gated, and you know, and they keep on. One, you know, from my experience, is one they're very uncomfortable with the EKG rhythms, and number two, they feel that it increases radiation dose, and that they're very comfortable reading around these artifacts. They recognize that. So, but you know. When it comes to, I think, serially following measurements, you really, you know, have to. Um, uh, and there's no doubt been cases where people have been referred to this institution with dissection, and you know the study is ungated. You, you repeat a CMR, and you know there's there's nothing there. You know, on that note, uh, again, I think uh, back on the same time that I showed you that data of the aortic disease, uh, there was a another study that showed again it was a couple. Uh, 
Pfizer claiming that they can work on a new drug. They were following it. Yeah, yeah, it was most cases right on with the Turkish company. Now that was, again, before we had now people who have Yeah, I mean, Ricardo, this is a very long test for access to it. And also, we just try to do all that and try to do a cost test and all that. And the one thing you found is don't do that if you just look for access to it. You may have right to the and I'll show you an example of that. So the conversation has alluded to the fact that how do we make measurements by CT? We use what's called an MRI. We use the double oblique method, where you really create a short axis view by going perpendicular to the flow of blood in u using two, uh, uh, two other views. Um, and then the measurement is external to external. And this, you know, theoretically, is exactly what, like as Dr. Q said, is what the surgeons measure when they put their, cali uh, their, their caliper on the aorta. This is so important to do, uh, to do it this way, is, and this is a great example of this. If you were to do a simple, in a very tortuous aorta with a lot of disease, if you were to simply do an axial measurement, here I can get 11.8 centimeters. But if you were able to really do the double oblique method where you go perpendicular to flow in two views and create a true short axis of that of that uh, area, of that, uh, that particular segment, you know, the measurement is significantly smaller. So when you are not making measurements that are uh, using the double, double oblique method, you are overestimating. Correct. Based on CT, yeah, absolutely. So why are the difference with echo? Or is there a I mean, echo. My understanding is you're doing leading edge to leading edge, right? Exactly. So you're not getting the back. In that old study, we also found the best leading edge in the surgery in the outside of the eye. So we, we actually switched. Okay, so the 2016 echo guideline is what to get a diffusion. You had a diffusion in terms of the ACA, ACC, thoracic aortic guideline in 2010.
stick with the same way down. So this is just the guidelines from the threat security guidelines. Again, just hitting the main points that I hoped I made was that you want to make these measurements at reproducible landmarks. You want to do it axial to the flow of blood, and you want to measure external to external. Um, one of the things, like I told you, this is going to be a, a potpourri of the order. One of the things that I, you know, I wanted to mention is what's defined. What is the definition of an aneurysm? We hear we hear the word used all the time. An aneurysm, by definition, has all three layers, intima media uh, uh, adventitia, but it's defined by a 50% increase compared to the normal diameter. So if you're ascending aorta, normal diameter is 3.7, 3.8. You know, you use the word aneurysm when it's 5.5 centimeters. Um, yes. Um, But that's a number you don't know. Yeah. The, I, I think what we're trying to differentiate is between what is a number where maybe prognosis changes. And I have some slides on that. Um, and by that, it's again, only relevant if the patient has a smaller sized, you know, body surface area. Uh, I'll show you some. I have some, uh, a slide on that. Whereas if they're very big, then, you know, I think those variables get co confused. I'll get now into a little bit about aneurysmal segments of the aorta. So the first part is, of course, sinus of, that, of, a, of a salva aneurysm. So this is a great example of one. Most commonly affected is the right coronary sinus followed by the non-coronary sinus. Um, these can protrude into the RVOT, obstructing them, or they can, as in this picture in C, where you see the blush of contrast, um, these can actually uh, rupture into the right heart, be it the right ventricle or the right atrium and lead to shunting. They can also uh, be, uh, uh, cause cardiac tamponade if they were to rupture into the um, pericardial sac. So let's talk a little bit now further up on the aorta, thoracic aneurysms. This is really the 18th most common cause of death. It's predominantly a silent disease, and it's growing in incidence as we discussed. Um, and one of the things we should know is that People who have thoracic aortic aneurysms, especially ascending thoracic aortic aneurysms, aneurysms there tends to be a very strong genetic component. And um, um, maybe this is a slide that, uh, you know, the fellows should go over at least before they sit over the, sit for their boards. There's very specific genetic defects with some of the common genetic syndromes, such as Marfan, Lloydietz, and Erlos Daniels. Um, and this is just another slide showing that along with these, uh, you know, uh, thoracic, uh, these, you, these patients have 
what do you call it, clinical features that can help you uh, make the diagnosis. Now, what's interesting is disease in the ascending, uh, in the thora uh, thoracic aorta is different whether it's ascending or descending. Disease above the ligamentum arteriosum or ascending aortic disease tends to be um, non atherosclerotic or is, its etiology is medial degeneration or the elastic fibers in the media. And again, this is usually uh, uh, with some sort of uh, uh, congenital or familial or genetic abnormality. Whereas below the ligamentum arteriosum or in the descending thoracic aorta, this is an atherosclerotic disease. And so here's just an example of an ascending thoracic aorta. This is what you may, you cannot, you, not only do you see the ascending aorta markedly enlarged, but you also see that the aortic root is enlarged. You see effacement of the sin, um, um, sinotubular junction. And this would be an aorta that can be very consistent with a patient with Marfan's. Uh, other uh, familial conditions that can cause associated aortopathies include bicuspid aortic valves. Here you can see, the, you know, um, in, in systole you can see clearly see this is a bicuspid valve, looks like a football, and you see the associated dilation of the ascending aorta. And this is just a recommendation that those patients who have uh, with bicuspid valves should have first degree relatives uh, screened. Now, what's interesting, this is a graph looking at risk of complications with um, uh, thoracic aneurysms. And what's good to know is that, you know, these complications really can occur at any size. But really, the takeoff where you have the most complications starting is around 6 centimeters. And this is just another graph also highlighting that point. If you look at the ascending aorta, really, where the risk of complications really jumps. It starts at around five and a half and really takes off after six centimeters. Descending aorta um, um, is a little bit, uh, I'm sorry, uh, in the ascending aorta starts around five and really takes off after six. In the descending aorta, around five and a half and then really takes off after seven. Um, this is a slide going over just some prognostic data, looking at patients who have different size thoracic aneurysms, what their outcome was. Obviously, it makes sense. The bigger the aorta, the worse their prognosis. But this is the slide that... Yes? Just to be five, it was only five years. Back in 1999, yeah. Now, this is just straightforward back in classroom. It doesn't tell you what they are dying. What their ideology is or what they're dying so from Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I will go back and look at this one in particular. But you're right, this is just a retrospective study. Very good points. And this is, I think, what point that uh, the table that I was referring to earlier uh, in, in reference to Dr. Zogby's question was, I think this is probably a little bit more helpful where, you know, if you have a normal-sized individual, there are some prognostic data where you can take the patient's aortic size and index it to their BSA. And I've put in the bottom, you know, Mod you become moderate risk, which is about 8% per year, when you're at 2.75 centimeters per BSA, and you're severe risk when you hit 4 centimeters per BSA. Now, obviously, this is, may not be helpful you know, in the Texas population where you have very morbidly obese people, but if a patient, especially on the lower spectrum and normal, uh, no, normal spec low spectrum BSAs and normal BSAs, this can be helpful.
Absolutely, yeah. That's a good question, Steve. I I have not seen that. I I believe so. Absolutely. If we have serial imaging, and add them up, it's interesting. Yeah. How does it relate to some of the other measurements? Yeah. Um, so when it comes to uh, recommendations what to patients with ascending aortic aneurysms, uh, I guess for board purposes, when do you refer to surgery? Uh, normally, if the, if the patient is symptomatic, if they have a size greater than 5.5 centimeters, or if they have a growth rate greater than 0.5 centimeters per year. If you have a situation where you have a familial condition or a syndrome, um, or an aortopathy, then the guideline, the, the recommendations for surgery are much earlier at a size anywhere from uh, 4.5 to 5, uh, 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 depending on, you know, how strong their family history may be. Um, okay, so this is, uh, again, now moving along the aorta. Uh, we're now at uh, talking a little bit about coarctation. Coarctation is another talk that really, you know, one slide doesn't do it justice. But this is a classic location. It's caused by a focal narrowing in the thoracic aorta, most commonly at the isthmus. That's a fibrous ridge. Uh, and we usually use the left subclavian artery to help us distinguish between subtypes. And, um, um, and one thing, you know, it's very important that if you do have a patient with coarct, you can see in the CT data set how you can see collateral vessels because blood has to get down to the legs and usually it comes, you know, from collateral vessels. But it's, very also, it's also very important to evaluate these patients for bare intracerebral berry aneurysms. Okay, so the final part of this talk is, you know, other um, insults to the aorta is ac acute aortic syndromes. And this is really, um, uh, uh, you know, where we're going to spend uh, most of our time. Um, you should know that these are uh, really all a related spectrum of diseases. They have a common clinical presentation. They frequently have common um, um, uh, uh, risk stratification and common uh, therapies involved. Most commonly are, their incidence is about three out of five out of 100,000 patients. Most common are aortic dissections at 72 percent. Uh, IMH follows at the, the, the next third and a, small, a smaller degree are the uh, penetrating aortic ulcers. Most common symptom is acute chest pain. However, because you're involving, could potentially involving branches of the aortic uh, trees, uh, you can present with all sorts of symptoms, including neurological symptoms, syncope, acute stroke symptoms, acute myocardial infarction, abdominal pain, peripheral neuropathies, paraplegia, cardiac arrest, sudden death if they have cardiac tamponade. So it's really a full spectrum. We really should think of aortic diseases when we see catastrophic illnesses in our patients. Um, what are the goals of imaging? Of course, it's to, you know, confirm the diagnosis, make measurements, classify, localize, you know, assess the extent, uh, look for branch vessel involvements, you know, is there viability of end or the end organs, and rule out any um, concomitant life-threatening complications. Now, just a quick word, you know, how do you choose between CT and CMR? We all know the strengths of each modality. CT is faster, uh, you know, patients, uh, because of that, may prefer it. 
Uh, it has, it, it's available in every you know, emergency room, um, and it really doesn't have any problems with metal. Cardiac MRI has the advantages of tissue characterization. It also provides functional hemodynamic information similar to echo. You can use it in patients who have iodine allergies. Uh, we, can have, we, we can use paramoxetol in those who have a GFR less than 30. And w one thing that's very important in choosing is if you have young patients or pregnant patients or patients you're going to be following with serial imaging for many, many, many years, definitely CMR has a strength there without, uh, you know, repeated uh, radiation insults. Um, so aortic dissection, what is an aortic dissection? Aortic dissection is really an intimal tear where, with a resultant propagation of blood, in, you know, uh, uh, systolic blood into the media of the vessel. Uh, it's the most common cause of acute aortic syndromes. About 66% tend to be male, elderly men, and 73% involve the ascending aorta. Of course, as we heard Dr. Q say, outcomes vary depending on your type, location, and presence of complications. But in general, it has the highest mortality. With the ascending aorta, we've all heard this, where you can have a risk of 1% to 2% per hour over the first 24 hours. So really important to make the diagnosis quickly, get these people to the operating room quickly. There has been some series. I've seen numbers all over the place. But in general, if, you know, if a patient is inoperable, they have a 58% of death, in-hospital death. Uh, and if you operate, mortality comes down to about 12%. Um, if for the descending aorta, uh, again, if it's uh, uh, is also uh, uh, not without its risks, uh, a complicated uh, aortic dissection there has a risk of almost 20%, whereas uh, it's 6% for uncomplicated uh, uh, diseases. Most common causes are hypertension. There are a risk. Uh, 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 there are you know there's tables of uh, you know most common causes of aortic dissection, or you can really use the same table for any of the acute aortic uh, syndromes. And it's very much linked to, to medial degeneration. And these, uh, this, uh, this hap tends to occur most commonly in patients with cardiovascular disease, so patients such as who have hypertension, or those who have connective tissue diseases, as we had mentioned. Uh, we talked a little bit about the DeBakey Stan and Stanford classifications. Uh, this is just a quick slide to show that of all the type A dissections, we often hear that the aorta has to be enlarged. But this is a nice table that does show that in this one particular study, the mean was 5.3, but aortic dissections did occur in smaller um, aortas. Um, now, unenhanced, uh, when it comes to CT, you know, we always think our oh, contrast is going to answer all the questions. But when in aortic dissections, actually, a non-contrast CT can be very helpful. And one of the ways we could, our first clue that you may have an aortic dissection is when we see calcium floating in the center of the vessel. And what this calcium uh, suggests is that the intima has torn, and now you have you know, two potential spaces. I'll, and I'll show you an image of that. So here's an image without the, the contrast, and here's an image with contrast. And now you can clearly see that uh, this, this uh, piece of calcium that was floating in the middle of the vessel is really um, a, 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 a piece of the, um, uh, is part of the intimal tear. Contrast that to someone who has a normal aorta uh, without a dissection, which may have mural thrombus. You can see all the calcium at the peripheral, periphery of the vessel. Um, contrast enhanced CT with cardiac MRI can provide a lot of useful information and can, uh, it helps you make the diagnosis. Classic findings are the double barrel lumen, which represents the true and false lumen separated by the intimal flap. We can identify entry sites and exit sites and at the same time identify dilations uh, and sizes of the aorta. Uh, fault, determining false lumen and true lumen, we have uh, a lot of features that can help us in general. The true lumen is the one that's communicating with uh, the flow of blood um, uh, through the aortic valve. Other clues that can help us is, you know, the large, usually the larger is the false lumen. The false lumen will have slower flow. It will be less enhanced. If you see a shredding, um, um, as demonstrated um, in some of these images where the star is, usually that also, it's called the cobweb sign. It's where the intima has sheared. That's also a sign of uh, the false lumen. 
And then there's wherever you have very tight angulations with the aortic wall, that's called a beak sign, also suggesting the false lumen. Uh, when it comes to assessing uh, complications, of course, this is a 3D technique, where, and with a large field of view, we're able to look at the carotids, we're able to assess you know, all the different arterial breads uh, and uh, uh, branches coming off the aorta. Other complications that we can look for are, as we had mentioned, if there's any evidence of blood within the pericardium, we have to be very concerned about uh, impending tamponade. You can see the dissection flap. You can look for the um, a ter uh, involvement of the coronary arteries. And in this one picture on the right, actually a hemithorax. Uh, MRI can also be very helpful. Um, and, you know, a lot of the, um, uh, you know, one, you can determine the um, um, chronicity of your, of your dissection. A flap that's very highly mobile suggests acute nature, whereas if you have a dissection that, if you have a flap that's immobile su suggests a chronic um, a dissection. And then looking at the flow in the true and the false lumens. In general, if, you, if your false lumen has not thrombosed, um, it is a marker of um, a worse prognosis, and the reason being is, you know, it's pressurized and therefore um, uh, can, can continue to expand. CMR can also be very helpful in identifying dynamic obstruction, and dynamic obstruction is really when the false lumen, if it is pressurized, goes and occludes um, one of the um, uh, mesenteric vessels or renal arteries with during systole, or, uh, you know, during some phase of the cardiac cycle. So this is one older study which actually looked at the three techniques and their predictive abilities into diagnosing um, uh, aortic dissections. And really, you know, CT and CMR both fare very, very well. TEE does, as w does well as well. Uh, in, an o in an older study, it seemed to have a little bit, it was less specific. Intramural hematoma is really a bleed within the media, usually caused by a rupture of the vasovasorum. There is no flowing blood. It's about, again, 20% of acute aortic syndromes. Its predisposition really is females and typically involving the descending aorta. It has a variable clinical course, but I think the, what to remember is about one-third will resolve. And patients where it's more likely to resolve are those who are younger with smaller aortic diameters, uh, smaller hematomas, and maybe those on beta blockers. Uh, of course, the other two-thirds, unfortunately, go on to suffer complications, including aneurysm, rupture, or progression to dissection. And when it comes to make CT making that diagnosis of intramural hematoma, uh, it's actually, again, the non-contrast CT that's very, very helpful. And here, because this is acute blood, uh, this, hap this tends to be a hyper-attenuating signal and actually appears as a crescentic shape uh, on the outside of the wall uh, of the aorta which does not spiral. Um, notice, when to give contrast, it actually can be a little bit more difficult to see now with CT, um, um, but the th main clues are no enhancement after IV contrast, no intermittent identified, and no spiraling. With, C with CMR and the ability to use our uh, tissue probing uh, techniques where we can actually identify thrombus, uh, it can be an easier diagnosis to make. But is this also going to see as an uh, uh, extensive increase? Correct. So that your eye should catch that. Your eye should catch that, yeah. But your point is, I mean, this is a show was very impressive that without the contrast, actually, you, you see it better. You see it without better. Yeah. And actually, Dr. Kia, I wanted to ask you, I have seen a lot of, when I'm doing TEs, I'll see, I'll some, well, I shouldn't say all of the time. I have seen this on, during TE, and I have, you know, in a patient that has no symptoms f or have no indication for that. And I've often thought it was fat on the aorta. Is, have you? Well, yeah, but zero is on the inside. You see outside, and it's it's cause it's this it's this thickening that you see, and yeah, I get nervous.
to the world. So the human side is fine. But that's when you measure with the outside and you just, you just don't know what to do with these people. Mm-hmm. Because, uh, you know, surgery is not your best bet. Well, don't you go with something like that tonight? Yeah. Mm. Okay. Um, this is just... One of the benefits, again, with CMR is you have all these different sequences and how, you know, your findings behave under in, in, in different pulse sequences. But in general, you'll see a concentric thickening, uh, which really with no identified um, uh, intimal tear and no uh, spiraling noted. So uh, th- there have been, you know, high-risk features of IMH, but basically the, thick, b- the more the hematoma, the worse uh, and um, uh, the more concerning it is. So finally, penetrating atheromatous ulcers, uh, also known as POWs. Uh, here, you really have to have atherosclerotic disease. Here, th- because of an in- inflammatory process, the internal lamina has eroded, and you have a plaque that has ulcerated into the media. Now, it classically, again, occurs in regions of atherosclerosis, with 90% being in the descending aorta. This can go on, again, to progress like the other um, acute aortic syndromes. It can go on to uh, either aneurysm formation in 27%, dissection, or rupture. And so here are examples. Again, they look like mu- you, you see atherosclerosis in each of these images, followed by a mushroom-like outpouching of the wall. Okay? And um, um, here is another one. Again, notice it's always its predilection is in a regions of atherosclerosis, such as the descending thoracic aorta. And here was an interesting case where you actually had a penetrating ulcer, and um, also, although the tissue co- intensity doesn't show it well here, but you had a, a, a associated with an intramural hematoma going down the descending thoracic aorta. And here is just an example of uh, some, uh, an image I saw um, on, online, which was good, n- nice to share with in a patient who had serial imaging. Here you can clearly see you know, evidence of where the wall should be, and you've got this penetrating aortic ulcer. This patient you know, went to him to have repeated imaging um, uh, uh, later on, and here you can clearly see that this is now developed into a saccular aneurysm. So just showing us that you know, the natural history of, uh, of this disease. Um, one of the things that I also learned during my reading for this, and I have, uh, you know, I've made this mistake before, is oftentimes, and, and it's very important with CT, is we'll often see in a, in a, in a, cert, in a patient who's postoperative, we'll often see very bright signals outside the lumen of the aorta. So, so one of the importance of this talk is not only to identify abnormalities, but to also understand what normal is. And, you know, there has been one case I remember I called up Dr. Reardon. I said, Dr. Reardon, I'm not sure, but I think there's extravasation of blood. And he's like, no, no, the patient's fine. How can it be? Um, uh, And I was seeing things like this all over the ascending aorta, these very focal spots of uh, what appeared to me as contrast outside of the wall of the aorta. And actually, this turns out to be this is all felt surgical material that they use um, at anastomotic and cannulation sites. So this is just a a normal post-operative aorta that you can often find. Um, now, you know, other worrisome findings, you know, thank goodness we haven't seen too many of these, but if, if you're going to have an aortic tri- uh, transection, the one that tends to survive, although they all have high mortality, is the one that occurs at the isthmus. Um, um, it, it is a, a sudden tearing of all three layers. It's usually caused by a rapid deceleration, usually a motor vehicle incident, or falling from heights. And what you'll classically see it in this location and what you're seeing here is, you know, just transse- complete transection of the aorta and with, with intraluminal thrombus forming. And obviously, if, you know, if this is not taken care of, this can be a very lethal disease. Yeah. Is holding the aortic pressure inside, yeah. Uh, medic- when it comes to medical therapy for any aortic syndromes, um, uh, you know, the most important is aggressive blood pressure control. 
Uh, you want to aim for blood pressures at 100 to 120. You want to use IV beta blockers as the first-line therapy to reduce DPDT. Opian analgesics are also important to bunt that, blunt that catecholamine response that you get. Um, treatment is, of course, dependent on the location of the aor acute aortic syndrome. If it involves, if it's a Stanford A, involves the ascending aorta, generally this is surgery. And if it's a uh, Stanford B, this is if, uh, where it's involving the descending, this is generally uh, medical uh, therapy unless there is um, um, end, end organ malperfusion and, and, and the or the development of complications. Uh, this is, again, just there's a lot of charts out there making recommendations, but, you know, once these people have had some sort of aortic surgery or ab aortic abnormality, there is periodic um, interval reassessment that is recommended by the um, um, uh, guidelines.